Greetings and salutations friends and welcome back to more Warhammer 40k lore. As today we are talking about one of the regiments of the Imperial Guard, the Valhallen Ice Warriors. Now, the Valhallens are a regiment that I have some natural sympathy with, though my own affinity for ice and the cold does also raise a couple of complaints about their design, but we'll get to that a little bit later. First and foremost, who are the Valhallen Ice Warriors? Well, obviously, as the name suggests, they hail from the world of Valhalla, a particularly cold little ball of rock spinning through the cosmos, though it was not always so. After all, why would humanity ever choose to settle an orbiting glacier unless it had some ridiculous deposits of ultra-valuable resources? I mean, come on, whose ancestors would ever be so undilutedly retarded as to settle a tiny windswept strip of land with barely sustenance level agriculture due to being made up mostly of mountains and rocks and with punishingly harsh winters on top of it all. <laughs> that would just be silly, wouldn't it? <laughs> Anywho, Valhalla, as mentioned, was not always this way. In fact, it was made into an ice world by a meteorite impact. Now, whilst the original settlement date of Valhalla is not known, humans had been on the planet for a very long time at this point. Long enough, in fact, to construct the kind of countermeasures that could potentially have destroyed an incoming asteroid. Unfortunately for the Valhallen ancestors, their orbital defences had not counted on the asteroid being made out of nearly 100% iron. That, plus the speed at which it was undoubtedly travelling, caused a uh, bit of a disaster. Now, somehow, this was not an extinction-level event, which is remarkable in and of itself, but the impact was powerful enough to send the planet spiralling ever so slightly out of orbit. Now, through yet another miracle, or curse, the planet then resettled into another stable orbit, but this time slightly further away from the sun, causing it to become the ice world we know today. Understandably, the populace, whatever minuscule percentage of it survived, uh, were a bit depressed at these news, and their long faces would turn longer still as their leaders informed them that this was just the beginning, and the people evaporated in the blast were probably the lucky ones. After all, misfortune loves company, and a meteoric impact is a great deal of company, as the initial meteor strike landing in the oceans causing enormous typhoons was just the beginning of a chain reaction of events that would see the world's food production capabilities basically wiped out. Now, fortunately, Valhalla was at least in part a hive world, as several large hive structures are described as surviving the blast and being encapsulated in a few hundred meters of solid ice. This in practice means that the population would have had ready-made bunkers in the form of the hive cities into which they could retreat. Furthermore, the hive cities would have their own power generation systems that could be enhanced and converted to provide heat primarily, rather than simply just lighting. The real problem would be food. Preceding the impact of Valhalla had been a pretty nice world, even described in some sources as a paradise world. It clearly had some hive cities, but its surface was obviously not covered in them like in a hive world. Instead, they would have had expansive areas of greenery and agricultural hinterlands, producing the majority, if not all, of the food that the planet's population consumed. 
But with the encroaching Ice Age, that was obviously no longer an option. And so the food needed to be salvaged as quickly as possible, brought into the relative safety and security of the Hive cities, and then alternative means of growing food would have to be created practically from scratch. This sudden and near-immediate cessation in food production capabilities would almost certainly have doomed the entire planet's population to a slow, lingering death by starvation. But as a silver lining, <laughs> a significant percentage of the population had recently been wiped out, leaving more food left over for those who were still around. The margins were still not exactly comfortable, but they were at least on the marginal hope side, rather than complete bleak despair. Furthermore, we also know that the Imperium has at least some knowledge of hydroponics and how to grow crops indoors without soil. It would undoubtedly still require large-scale reworking of the internals of hive cities, but given enough time, alternative food sources could undoubtedly be created. If the Valhallans were blessed with an overabundance of time, that is. As the galaxy decided to add to their miseries by introducing an orc invasion. <laughs> Conveniently timed. I can't help but wonder if that enormous asteroid didn't just happen to have some massive engines bolted onto it somewhere. But regardless of whether or not the asteroid impact came as a pure coincidence, or whether it came about as a part of a cunning plan, the orcs were there, and arriving in ever greater numbers, displaying a brilliant example of orcish foreplanning, they landed on the recently frozen ball of hoarfrost only to realize, oh shit, there's nothing to eat around here, except for the humans, that is. It should come as no great surprise to you that the Valhallans has ever since developed a rather pronounced dislike for Greenskins, as the two frozen factions engaged in a pretty damn brutal bout of mutually genocidal warfare. You might also be wondering around about this point, where the hell is the Imperium in all of this? Valhalla was an Imperial world populated by a human population. Surely the Imperium would send disaster relief, additional food transports maybe, uh, aid workers, maybe even some technology to set up the aforementioned hydroponic farms. At the absolute least they'd be dispatching Imperial Guard forces to fight off the invading orcs, surely. Well. That's the thing, the Imperial Guard didn't exist yet, because this happened at the absolute very tippy most tail end of the Age of Strife. The war against Horus and his traitors had just barely begun to wrap up properly. The Imperial Guard was still the Imperial Army. The mainstay of the Imperial's military was still supposed to be the Adeptus Astartes, who were shattered and brutally understrengthed. The fate of one world in the midst of this mess was absolutely nothing whatsoever, and so Valhalla was most assuredly alone in its triumph. And it wasn't going very well for the Valhallans either initially. Very little detail about the war has survived till modernity, or more correctly, it's a conflict that hasn't really been expanded upon all that much in 40k's history, but the orcs were winning. And it's not hard to imagine why. As a species, the orcs are a hell of a lot tougher than baseline humanity, and would be able to deal with the extremely harsh climate conditions much, much better than the Valhallan defenders, particularly as up until, well, literally last year, they were not 
not an ice world. They were not used to these conditions, nor were they prepared to operate in them. As a Norwegian, I can tell you this, that dealing with mere winter conditions on the level of our modern world requires a tremendous amount of preparation and specialized equipment. And even that is, of course, nothing compared to what would happen if a world was covered in ice. The unique doctrines that would need to be developed, the unique machinery, the trial and error that would be required to develop ways around now problems that will be commonplace and everywhere would take a very long time. Not to mention, of course, getting humans used to the extreme environments. Toss on an enormous globe spanning food crisis on top of it all, and you've got yourself quite the recipe for disaster. Especially as whilst the orcs were more than happy to take whatever food the humans had managed to store up, they were better suited to deal with the harsh realities of Valhalla than the humans were yet again. Because whilst humans tend to be somewhat picky eaters in that they're not overly fond of cannibalism, the Greenskins could not care less about eating their lessers. Hell, goblins are practically walking snack packs by orcish standards. Plus, orcish spores, which are frequently used as a food source, can grow quite literally everywhere, primarily due to plot reasons, including on ice worlds. But the defenders had a one advantage that the orcs did not. Ingenuity and good old fashioned desperation. <laughs> Necessity is, of course, the mother of all invention, and the Valhallans, well, they started to earn their more modern name of Ice Warriors by realizing that, hold on a second, our planet is literally covered in frozen ice. Ice can be melted, ice can be worked, ice can be tunneled through. And so they started literally moving through the ice, utilizing specialized equipment, allowing them to outflank and surprise the orcs again and again, as they were unable to replicate the feats of the Valhallen defenders. Even so, the orcs were no doubt a tenacious foe, and would have required years and years of hard, grueling warfare to eradicate, but over time, slowly but surely, the Valhallans were able to reconquer their world and begin re-establishing their society. Which was by now beginning to lean in a decidedly militaristic direction. <laughs> Again, not a tremendous shock. Having managed to barely survive the orc invasion, Valhalla had an enormous planetary defense force. Military rigor and discipline was worked into everyday life. It became the mentality of Valhalla in a sort of similar way to how it ended up becoming on Krieg, where it becomes a credos, a way of living, a philosophy. On Valhalla, every crime, no matter how slight, no matter how minute, no matter how victimless, is always punished in the exact same way. Death. Which might seem extreme, but in the closed environments of the sub-glacial? I believe that's the term, hives of Valhalla, even the most minute disruption of the natural order could cause widespread damage. For make no mistake, Valhalla is as much a death world as it is an ice world. Everything must be rationed and portioned out extremely carefully. Everything from heat to purified water to food, to power, to fuel, all of the day-to-day -day necessities of merely maintaining human life and keeping the industry that serves the populace alive and functional enough to continue to provide these raw resources to them. And all of this, of course, on a planet that has precious little access 
to most of these resources. Heat is a um, scant commodity on an ice world, of course. Food, too, is difficult to come by, to the point where apparently Valhalla has cultivated a rather unique source of nourishment. Um, <laughs> cave slime, <laughs> which is just about as appetizing, I imagine, as the name makes it sound. Now, thank the God Emperor, this is not the only source of nourishment on the entire planet. As uh, they say, life always finds a way. There are even some creatures that are capable of existing on Valhalla today, that have probably evolved through some remarkable series of coincidences to be able to, well, turn from whatever they were when the meteor hit to stuff like the Thraki today, which is apparently a very large and slow-moving creature that inhabits the upper ice drifts of Valhalla. Again, how on God's good green earth these things would have evolved in the first place is an interesting quandary, but there they are. They're also apparently extraordinarily easy to kill, which raises yet further questions, but let's not dwell on those for too long. There is also the, um, the T, frequently mentioned in the Commissar Cyphers Kane books, Tana, I believe, which well, here's the thing. Tana is apparently a leafy plant that grows somewhere in the caves of Valhalla. Presumably the less, you know, frozen to death parts, one would guess. And it is a deeply favoured brew by the local populace. Um, quite possibly because it is the only locally available brew that isn't water. But even Cyphus Kane developed quite the taste for Tana after having served for a very long period of time with Valhallen regiments. He was pretty much the only outsider who did, however, and everybody else he managed to at some point or other trick into trying the tea. Well, best case scenario, they were diplomatic in telling him it tasted ghastly, and worst case scenario, they just vomited it all over the floor. In all due likelihood, it is a fairly disgusting <laughs> drink. But compared to water, presumably made from either recycled piss or cave slime, who knows, it might be a preferable alternative. But fret not, the sufferings of the Valhallen people is not all in vain. It is not a pointless thing that they must suffer in such ghastly circumstances for the entirety of their existence. It serves, in fact, a higher purpose. For after the War of Survival, as the Valhallens call it, their increasingly militaristic ways, which allowed them to survive on their now hellhole of a planet, also made them the perfect recruits for the recently newly established Adeptus Muratorum, who, scattering across the galaxy trying to restore order to a once shattered Imperium, realized that these tough little ice worlders would make perfect recruits to the new Imperial Guard. And right they were, as the Valhallans have developed quite the reputation within the Guard. First and foremost as excellent orc killers, as the by now hereditary hatred of Greenskins is passed down to every generation, who also learns the various tricks on how to kill the Greenskinned menace. They also take a particular pleasure in revenging themselves on their ancestral foes. Obviously, the Valhallans are also capable of not only surviving, but effectively operating in climates that would be less than conducive to the survival of other Imperial Guard regiments. Obviously, they are specialized for deployment on ice worlds or extremely cold environments, though they have the perseverance required to adapt themselves to almost any environment. There's even a couple of uh, funny mentions in the uh, Cyphus Kane books, as I mentioned previously, where the Valhallans are dispatched to less than chilly battlefields here and there as well. 
But fighting orcs is not the only benefit that their upbringing has given them. If you have to live every day of your life hand to mouth, sucking cave slime off the walls of your habitation plant, you, um, you, you, you tend to develop a certain resolve, <laughs> even in the face of the most ridiculous of odds. Well, Hallen troops therefore very rarely, if ever, break. No matter the opposition they are faced against, they can be counted on to form the solid bulwark of any Imperial Guard front line. They can also be relied upon to carry out even the most ridiculous and suicidal offensives with cold near callous detachment. But unlike the men of Krieg, the Valhallans will not simply just march to their death in overwhelming numbers because, well, ice world. Their numbers are not quite as infinite as their Krieg cousins. Instead, they tend to be a bit more ingenious when it comes to the completion of their mission. The Valhallan engineers, the ones that originally saved their world by discovering how to effectively tunnel through the ice of Valhalla, has on many an occasion been the salvation of Valhallan troops in the field. They also bring with them some specialized equipment in the form of their rather unique thermally insulated greatcoats, which allow them to survive environments that would kill other humans in mere seconds, which is rather impressive and, if you will forgive me here, I need to do a slight little deviation at this point, a little bit of a detour, because the Valhallen Ice Warriors are one of those regiments that have uh, a bit of an interesting inspiration to them. I keep seeing them referred to as Russians, which is not really, I would say, correct. I would rather say Eastern Front in general slash Finnish Winter War rather than straight up Russians, with just a dash of Scandinavian in there as well, of course, with the name the Valhallen Ice Warriors. And I will of course elaborate on this. Their great coats, for example, for which they are so famous, is far more reminiscent of the German great coat during the Second World War than the Russian one. As you can see, the German one had a doubled buttoned up front, whereas the most common Russian one did not. Now the Russians did also have double buttoned great coats, but they tended to be reserved for officers. Furthermore, the Russian winter uniform was not actually a great coat, nor was it intended to be the German winter uniform either, but uh, well, Germany's preparation for winter warfare was a pinch more lacking than their Russian adversaries. No, the Russian winter uniform was actually this you can see right here. A two-piece uniform made up of a jacket and a pair of pants. These were heavily padded and insulated and were worn on top of the regular wool uniform, which would in most cases be supplemented with yet another layer of clothing beneath it again. Because as anyone who is used to living in intense cold will tell you, the only protection is multiple layers of clothing. It is not about keeping the cold out, it is about keeping your heat in. Which leads me to my final complaint about the greatcoat uniforms, namely that greatcoats are not actually very good winter uniforms at all because they're coats. <laughs> it is very easy for the heat to escape. Instead, the greatcoats, like the Russian issue ones, which were often carried like a sash around the body, which is another thing that is often shown on the Valhallen Ice Warriors, even though they are currently wearing their greatcoats, so I'm presuming that is simply uh, additional 
cloth that they carry with them for reasons. I mean, hell, you can never have too much insulation on an ice world, I do suppose. But anyways, the great coats were issued for middling cold environments. You know, minus 10, 12, 15 or so. When it gets worse than that, a great coat is simply not going to cut it. Now, I will go to the Valhalla's defense, however, and say that they do mention that they are specifically insulated great coats. Now, I'm presuming this means that it has some sort of internal heating, which is far from impossible. I mean, we have this technology today to heat up clothing using electricity, for example. And so it is entirely possible that the Great Coat can contain a series of various heating elements focused around the uh, the underarm, the uh, the chest, the back, the groin area, and the areas where you have most of your blood vessels, for example. However, even in such a scenario, you would be far, far better served with a cold weather suit rather than a Great Coat. <laughs> Now that I've gotten my Norwegian out of the way, let me continue breaking down the equipment of the Valhallen Ice Warriors, which is, for the most part, relatively standard. They are issued with flak armor, which is usually worn underneath the greatcoat, as again, only protection against extreme cold is multiple layers. They are also armed with the relatively standard M36 lasgun, although the Valhallen equivalent tends to be customized for the extreme conditions of their home world. Exposed metal parts, for example, should preferably be insulated or protected in some way, shape, or form. The stock is usually switched out for a wooden one, which is going to perform a little bit better, and also uh, well, turn into a little bit of a less of a hazard for the person operating the weapon. Extreme cold and exposed metallic surfaces do not necessarily go together particularly well, especially when they might need to be operated by a human. They also carry the usual assortment of frag and crack grenades, including a knife, standard issue respirators, and your basic survival gear. Their specialized equipment when it comes to the greatcoat, however, also extends to a insulated helmet and a special little hat that can be worn on the underside of their flak armored helmet. Their hat, reminiscent of the... <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm sure it has a proper name, but in Norwegian we call these hats bear pussies. <laughs> Which is a tidbit I'm sure you would enjoy. This is also insulated and protected in the same way as the greatcoat. Now, if I were to be pedantic about it, I would say that they really should be having some kind of face covering as well. Not to mention goggles, because, well, if you're gonna be living on an ice world... Take it from me, snow blindness is a very, very real thing. And something to protect your eyes, it'd probably be a pretty good idea, honestly. When it comes to non-infantry equipment, the Valhans prefer to be quite heavily mechanized if possible, and they really enjoy their artillery support. Again, a bit reminiscent of the Red Army, which... You can accuse the Russians of a lot of incompetence during the Second World War, but they had the single finest artillery park in the entire conflict, no questions asked. And the Valhallans too prefer to conduct their operations with heavy guns on their side, supporting their maneuvers and their advances, and covering their engineers as they play their dirty little tricks on the opposition. No doubt their vehicles, too, are especially fitted out to allow them to operate in the extreme conditions of Valhalla and similar ice worlds. Because, well, here's the thing, a lot of machinery, it doesn't operate particularly well if frozen solid, and preventing it, it from freezing over requires quite a lot of work, and usually the introduction of fairly strict regimes, like turning the engine over for so and so many minutes every hour or so to make sure that it, well, doesn't freeze solid. Extreme condition survival really does all come down to experience, to knowing the tricks, and to knowing what is and is not required. 
And when it comes to their particular niche of extreme cold weather survival, there is no force quite like the Valhallen Ice Warriors in the entirety of the 41st millennium. And with that, I will bid you adieu once more. Thank you all very much for listening, and I hope to see you all again soon. Till then, have a good day.